Hi! Today on Periodic Perfection, I'm going to be looking at a top 10 list for the number one things you need to know about atomic chemistry. They're in no particular order, and they're all kind of important. So let's go! Okay, starting us off with number 10, models of the atom. Let's start off going back the furthest point in history, and let's talk a little bit about Dalton. Dalton's model was the hard sphere model. He thought that the atom was a solid sphere. This was followed by Thompson. Thompson did the cathode ray experiment, and he had his model called the plum pudding model, which was a sphere with of positiveness with tiny little negatives scattered in it, kind of like the fruit in a fruit cake, hence the plum pudding model. This was followed by Ernest Rutherford, who worked for Thompson. He did the very famous gold foil experiment where he proved two things about the atom. He bombarded an atom with alpha particles, which were heavy and positive. He thought they were all going to go through the gold foil, um, but what he found was that while most of them went straight through, many of them were deflected. And this led him to two conclusions. Conclusion number one, the atom is mostly empty space. He concluded this because most of the particles went straight through. His second conclusion was that the atom has a dense positive nucleus. And that came from his observation that some of the particles were deflected, which meant they were hitting something heavy and positive. So. That's your Ernest Rutherford. He's followed by the Bohr model, also known as the planetary model, where electrons are found outside of the nucleus and they're generally orbiting in what he called orbits around a central positive nucleus. This was further modified later in the wave mechanical model of the atom, also known as the modern model, where the electrons aren't traveling in fixed orbits per se, but in general regions of space where we are likely to find an electron, hence being called an orbital. Okay, so that's our history. Let's move on to number nine, parts of the atom. So if we're talking about the parts of the atom, the main things you need to know is that atoms are made out of three main subatomic particles, neutrons, protons, and electrons. Protons are positive, they're found in the nucleus, and they have a mass of exactly one AMU. We also have neutrons in the nucleus, their charge is neutral, and they also have a mass of one AMU. So remember, protons and neutrons have the same mass. Our third subatomic particle is the electron. Electrons are negatively charged and have a mass of 1 1836th of an AMU. In fact, they are so tiny that they virtually have no mass at all. Alrighty, that takes us to number eight, which is numbers of the atom. So there are a few numbers that you need to know about the atom, and you can find these on the periodic table. You need to know what they are and how they work. First off, atomic number. Atomic number is generally considered to be the number of protons in your atom. Atomic number never changes for an element, and thus neither does the number of protons. In a neutral atom, the number of electrons will equal the number of protons because your positive and negative charges must balance out in order to have a neutral atom. The nuclear charge of any atom is the charge only in the nucleus. You have two things in the nucleus, neutrons and protons. Neutrons are neutral, thus having no charge, and protons are positive. So your nuclear charge for any element would be equal to its number of protons. Next we have our mass number. Mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Because these two particles count for most of the mass of an atom, adding them together gives you your mass number. Make a note, mass number is not the same as atomic mass. We'll be talking about that in a few moments. Your number of neutrons is always going to be equal to your mass number, which by the way is a whole number, and minus your atomic number. So essentially it's the total mass minus the number of protons will give you your neutrons. 
our neutrons and protons make up most of the mass for our atom. And that brings us to seven, which is atomic mass. Your atomic mass for any element is the weighted average of all the naturally occurring isotopes for that element. In order to do that calculation, you would take your mass of your isotope, multiply it by the decimal percent abundance for that specific isotope, and add it to the same calculation for each of the other isotopes. I'm going to put that formula up on the page right here. Um, so remember, atomic mass will never be a whole number. That is that decimal value that is shown on the periodic table. Now we can take atomic mass and from that get our mass number by rounding to the nearest whole number value. And that leads us to number six, isotopes. Isotopes have the same atomic number, but a different mass number. So these are the same element, but with a different number of neutrons, thus giving them a new mass number. In terms of subatomic particles, isotopes all have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So those are isotopes. Remember, isotopes are involved in calculating your average atomic mass, which is sometimes referred to as average isotopic mass. See how those work together? This leads us into number five, details about the electron. So first thing to remember about electrons is they have a generally negative charge. They're located in orbitals outside the nucleus. They also have specific level configurations. For the purpose of regions chemistry, you can think about it like this. The first level can hold two electrons, the next level can hold eight, the level after that 18, the following one 32, and so on. Um, electrons have a specific amount of energy. Each of those energy levels has a specific amount of energy, and that energy increases the further away we get from the nucleus. So the first energy level, or the N1 level, has the lowest energy. The second one would be a little bit more. The third would be even more than that. Electrons can be in excited state, or they can be in ground state. The ground state electron configurations are what is shown on the periodic table. They're the point at which the electrons have the lowest possible amount of energy. And that brings us to number four, excited state atoms. When electrons get excited, they can move up an energy level. If this happens, then we are said to have an excited atom. So those electrons can jump levels absorb energy to go to those higher energy levels. In order to attain those higher energy levels, the electrons have to have more energy than the level they were previously in. Basically think about it like they have to gain the energy to match the level that they're wanting to go to. And that brings us to number three, bright line spectra. Bright line spectra are like an atomic fingerprint. They're a series of lighted lines of specific colors and specific wavelengths that are formed when electrons jump down, very important, jump down from their excited state back down to their ground state. Remember, in order to get excited, those electrons had to absorb energy to move up. That's unstable, they can't stay there, and that energy is released in the form of light when they jump back down. But those wavelengths of light are specific to the distance that the electrons are falling. And each element has a different number of electrons and a slightly different arrangement of orbitals because of that configuration of electrons within them. So they can create different patterned bands of light. And they are so specific that you can look at the pattern bands and you can tell what element you're looking at. So they're used for identification purposes. And this was this is actually how the gases in the sun were discovered because a very astute scientist um, looked at their bright line spectra and realized they match to hydrogen and to helium. That brings us to number two, Lewis dot diagrams. So as a part of Lewis dot diagrams, we're going to talk a little bit about first valence electrons. Valence electrons are the most outer shell of electrons for any atom.
These are the electrons that dictate the chemical behavior of that element. They govern how that element reacts and how it bonds, or in the case of noble gases, how it doesn't bond. Members of the same group in the periodic table will always have the same number of valence electrons and thus they behave in similar ways. Remember, every element in its most stable form wants to achieve what we call a stable octet of valence electrons. This would mean that its last shell has eight valence electrons and thus acts like a noble gas. To get there, elements will bond or form ions. Now, let's look at our electron dot diagrams. I'm gonna do an example one for you with sulfur. The first thing you do when you're drawing a Lewis dot diagram is you draw the kernel. The kernel is the symbol for the element and it represents all of the nucleus and the non-valence level electrons. You then fill in the electrons, the valence electrons only, going around the outside of the kernel. I like to think of the kernel as having a square around it, and I'm going to put two electrons on each side of the square. The first two electrons I put on the top, first pair in the air, and then the other ones I fill in going around once, putting in a single electron in each side, and then going around again. So in the case of sulfur, we would have, and we would end up with two electrons on the top, two on the right, one on the bottom, and one on the left. And that's Lewis dot structures. And now for number one, ions. Ions are one of the topics that people oftentimes consider to be the most difficult to understand, but they really are the most important and enduring in terms of continuing in chemistry and thinking about bonding and reactions. So the first thing to know about ions is ions are formed by looking at their ionization energy. Ionization energy is the minimum amount of energy required to remove the most loosely held valence electrons from an atom in gaseous form. We can find this on table S, and the general rule is that metals tend to have a very low first ionization energy, and nonmetals tend to have a very high first ionization energy. The higher your first ionization energy, the more tightly you hold on to your valence electrons, which makes it much less likely that you'll lose them. If your first ionization energy is very low, it makes it much more likely that that element will lose its valence electrons when it is forming an ion. Now for ions themselves, they are charged atoms. Notice before this, all the atoms have been neutral. Now we're talking about charged atoms and they result from the loss or gain of electrons. Most common charges of ions are found by looking at the oxidation number of the elements on the periodic table. But here's what you need to know. Negative ions are formed by gaining electrons through the process of reduction and this results in a negatively charged ion. These are called anions. Anions are negatively charged ions. Positively charged ions are formed by losing electrons through the process of oxidation. These are positively charged ions and are called cations. Cations are positive. Generally, when we get into bonding and reactions, your positive ions and your negative ions are going to want to react with one another to create stable substances. So those were the top 10 things you need to know about atomic chemistry. Thanks.